Regulation dulls the incentive for firms to improve productivity, cease unsuccessful investments early, and diversify into other ventures. Let me say that again, because it just might be the most important sentence I'm going to say today, so perhaps it is worth saying twice. Regulation dulls the incentive for firms to improve productivity, cease unsuccessful investments early, and diversify into other ventures. I wish I had written that important sentence, but sadly, I did not. It is copyright the Commonwealth of Australia 2014. Included in the options paper, Approaches to Regulating Coastal Shipping in Australia, issued by the Department of Infrastructure and Regional Development. Mind you, if I had written it, I might have added the word inappropriate ahead of regulation. Company directors are, if it is at all possible, even more focused on regulation reduction than the government and regulators. Of course, directors are, like most groups, quite self-interested. It's unsurprising then that directors would focus on reduction in regulation as fully a quarter of board time is spent on red tape and compliance, according to the Australian Institute of Company Directors' Director Sentiment Index, a biannual survey of Australian directors. The survey also reveals an expectation that this time requirement will increase going forward. This leaves very little time for the real work of the board in determining the strategy of the company, monitoring financial performance, and ensuring effective management succession. A good example of wasted board time is the review of reporting on energy efficiency opportunities. Now, of course, no one is going to argue against the importance of energy efficiency. It just does not need a report to the government checked by the board and signed off by the managing director, particularly when ENGES reporting shines a light on the topic and there is a clear financial incentive to take action. Directors are not focused on red tape and regulation reduction merely for self-interest or indeed for reduction's sake alone. Directors are focused on red tape and regulation because it's a huge impediment to productivity improvement in our economy, second only, in their opinion, behind the poor current general economic conditions. It seems to me that it should be quicker and easier to do something about red tape and regulation than about general economic conditions. Productivity growth is the biggest economic challenge Australian companies face, according to the Director Sentiment Index. It is therefore no wonder directors are really pleased at the Commonwealth Government's clear commitment to cut red tape and compliance costs by a billion. But the question being asked in the boardrooms of corporate Australia is, will this happen? And will it happen fast enough? There is some healthy scepticism. Directors remain to be convinced. Consider the question of the carbon tax. It appears that around July 21, we could see a vote for carbon tax repeal. Good, I say. But the repeal is to be from 1 July, leaving a three-week period where the carbon tax will still be law, but then retrospectively disappear. Consider West Farmers' natural gas business with thousands of customers. Customers will be entitled to refunds, dollar here, two dollars there, but multiplied by thousands. Also, West Farmers outlets under the names such as Clean Heat Gas Gas Houses and Bunnings sell LPG cylinders, lots of them. These businesses do not have an easy way of tracking customers in the 21-day period to refund any carbon tax paid, should there be a repeal. Of course, customers could be invited to come in um, for a refund, but at 81 cents on a $20 9 kilo cylinder as sold in WA, many may see it as not worth their while but it will leave a bad taste in their mouths, create a small fracture in the customer relationship. These sorts of unintended consequences are what leads business to question whether government understands what doing business actually entails. West Farmers had looked and failed to find such a tax that's been retrospectively repealed anywhere in the world. Concerningly, overall director sentiment has fallen as measured by the AICD index. The index weights director responses on current and future economic and business conditions, as well as key regulatory, governance and public policy issues to obtain an overall indication of sentiment. You can see from the chart that sentiment has indexed below zero since February 2011, when then Prime Minister Gillard introduced the carbon tax, disappointing much of the Australian business community. 
Sentiment began to rise strongly in the first half of 2013 when the federal election was announced. There seems to be a level of disappointment creeping in as the index has now dropped at the last survey. The proportion of directors who believe that the federal government understands business has decreased. Less than 30% of directors believe the governance performance is positively affecting their business decision making and consumer confidence. 70% of directors did expect the new government to have a positive impact on decision making and fully 80% expected it to have a positive impact on consumer confidence. So these results from the survey are showing quite an about face. What did directors expect to happen to demonstrate the government was about to have a positive impact on their business? I think they expected a quick reduction in red tape, but they say that time spent on regulatory compliance has actually increased over the last 12 months. Only 40% believe that red tape will decrease over the coming year. The business community, as represented by these directors, is not asking our legislators to put a man on the moon. The things that have the most impact are the blocking and tackling of business, as shown on this slide. Paying tax, making workplaces safe, recruiting workers and giving greater flexibility. Flexibility is, of course, very dear to my heart, as this is one of the major things holding back a very disadvantaged segment of our workforce, that being women. Now, not everyone will be convinced by the opinion of company directors, and Australia certainly has a reputation as being an open and business-friendly economy. The US-based conservative think tank Heritage Foundation lists Australia at number three on its index of economic freedom, just behind Singapore and Hong Kong. The foundation considers things such as rule of law, limited government, regulatory efficiency, and open markets in its index. But in stark contrast to this, on the World Economics Forum's burden of government regulation ranking shown on this chart, Australia ranks 128th. The last four years have displayed a strong downward trend. Now, this survey is based on the opinion of companies in the individual countries administered by a local survey organisation. So, um, may not be strictly comparable data, but I think it is another reflection of the concern in Australian business on these topics. So now, in considering the root and branch review of competition law, I think it's absolutely unquestionable that government has a role in regulating business and industry, and that good governance is vital to a healthy economy. Competition is the best way to achieve lower prices for consumers, good service and reliability. But the difference that appropriate competition and regulatory settings can make is evident. If you consider uh, the experience of the dairy industry in New Zealand compared to the dairy industry in Australia. Um, as shown on this particular slide. Um, I'm indebted to McKinsey and Company for the research on this case study. Um, it's startling to consider the 11.7% CAGA over a decade in New Zealand dairy exports and compare it to the 0.1% growth in CAGA in the same period in Australia. The obvious question is, what has made the difference? New Zealand has relatively the same transport cost to international markets. Australia enjoys a similar climate, although drought and floods are recent issues. Australia also has excellent agricultural science and technology, but perhaps higher energy and feed costs. It appears New Zealand has prioritised international competitiveness over domestic market considerations. I think New Zealanders and their legislators and regulators have perhaps a small economy mindset. This has allowed them to take a whole of system approach taking into consideration that New Zealand is a low population economy that has traditionally been a long way from consumer markets. In these circumstances, oligopolistic structures might be considered inevitable. Let me be clear, this is not a call for national champions. Um, that's a different, and I agree it's spurious. In Australia, I think this whole of system approach has not been taken as effectively as the premise seems to be that the Australian economy is just big enough not to need to. Now, I've just spent a week in China, and I'm here to tell you Australia is not anywhere near big enough, nor by a long shot, not by a long shot. Um, but if competition and regulatory settings are appropriate, Australia can participate in Asia, as New Zealand is. Just a small slice of the Asian market will deliver huge scale benefits to Australian companies. But our companies have to be big enough and competitive enough to go to Asia in the first place. Uh, let me note the comments that previous speaker Rod Sims um, made on this topic and also in this morning's Australian Financial Review. 
Rod, I think you absolutely rightly suggested if a company can't be successful on the domestic stage, it is unlikely to be successful on the international stage. Um, Rod also rightly noted in the paper that cosy duopoly or oligopoly industry structure is unlikely to create globally competitive companies. Um, given I propose oligopoly can be inevitable in a small economy, no surprise that I see a really key role for Australia's regulator um, is to remove any hint of cosiness um, in such industry structures through appropriate competition law and regulation. That will help us keep a pro-competitive culture, which I agree with you is completely under threat um, at the minute in our economy. So I do hope that the government's regulation agenda and the root and branch review of competition law will yield real improvements for Australian business. Um, I was asked particularly to describe factors hampering productivity that I would like to see addressed. Um, it was an almost impossible task, um, I think as Ian has said, to hone down the long list to a few, few things, but um, let me have a go. Uh, one important category of reform is to address inconsistency across states. Um, an example of inappropriate inconsistency in states is the different licensing requirements for tradespeople um, and certification of occupation that then flows into the education system. Uh, we also have restrictive licensing in professions such as law and medicine um, that create barriers to entry and are different across states. Another example is the unique liquor licensing law in Queensland that requires the ownership of a hotel licence as a precondition of owning standalone licences required for retail liquor outlets. As the Australian hotel business model incorporates gaming, regulation can drive companies to participate in gaming when they might otherwise choose not to do so. Um, there are the restrictions on, on pharmacy ownership as well, which have been mentioned by previous speakers, which increase health healthcare costs. And in the oil and gas arena, where Transfield is active, five different state and Commonwealth bodies review and consult on one single mandatory requirement for oil spill planning in offshore projects in Commonwealth waters off Western Australia. These anomalies should be removed. Uh, regulation should be brought into line with laws in the states and duplication removed. Within states, anomalies also exist in the retail arena. Petrol stations in WA can open any time but are restricted in what can be sold. After 9pm on Thursdays, you can buy pantyhose, but not underpants. If Bunnings wishes to trade 7am to 7pm, they can sell wood fire heaters, but not gas heaters, light bulbs, but not light fittings. Now, this all sounds very amusing, but it denies customers choice and it concentrates traffic in hours that are determined by regulation rather than by customer need. Assets are not as productive as they could be, and real costs are added to doing business, making store inventory management and staff rostering more difficult and costly. Uh, there are also uniquely Australian standards that are slightly different to global standards that reduce national productivity and competitiveness. We have our own packaging sizes, our own bicycle helmet standards, and our own, very own definition of gluten-free. Um, our tourism industry, and you heard I'm a commissioner of Tourism WA, is at threat from a standard that's different to global standards, and I was very pleased um, that Rod talked about shipping. Coastal shipping cabotage has a detrimental effect on cruising tourism to Australia. It's a growth industry for us. Foreign flag ships of greater than 5,000 gross tonnes are exempted from cabotage. The initial standard is to exempt ships greater than... Four, the international standard, sorry, is to exempt ships greater than 4,000 gross tonnes. But ships 4,000 gross tonnes carrying around 100 passengers across Australian domestic ports pay in the order of $50,000 and are required to apply Australian terms and conditions to crew. The ongoing inclusion of Australia in itineraries for foreign flag vessels will be in doubt as other global destinations are more profitable and less regulated. So if at least some of these issues can be addressed, I think Australia will be better placed, uh, as we've talked before, to catch the Asian wave and exploit our national, natural advantages and proximity to economies that are expected to generate 50% of the world's GDP. Thank you.